This is a production of West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by West Virginia University, offering education, health care, and the opportunity to achieve career success since 1867. Information at go.wvu.edu slash forward. Welcome to the Legislature Today. I'm Brianna Heaney. We are in the final few days and there is a rush to get bills across the finish line, including the budget bill. More on that in a bit. Much of the debate in the House of Delegates this morning focused on satisfying that $465 million federal clawback regarding the state's spending on education. When it came to the budget debate, some promised program funding, not education related, fell by the wayside. Randy Yowie reports. House Finance Committee Chairman Vernon Chris, a Republican from Wood County, wanted to make the reason behind passing Senate Bill 701 perfectly clear. The bill talks of supplementing and amending appropriations to the Department of Education School Construction Fund. The bill appropriates $150 million to the School Building Authority, setting precedent by satisfying all the reconstruction requests made by state school districts. Chris said the allocation intentionally goes towards satisfying the executive branch's goal of showing in-kind state education funding to waive a potential $465 million federal clawback. The issue came up last week over concerns that the state did not spend enough money on education to match federal COVID money. There, there are uh, HVAC projects. There is actually, I think there were actually maybe two or three actual new schools involved in the projects, uh, some roof projects. But a cumulative, it was $150 million, and that these, these dollars were, would help in the, uh, from what the governor's office had explained, would help towards the negotiations of, with the Federal Department of Education. The bill passed 94 to 2 and now goes to the governor. Debate on the House Budget Bill 4025 began with a series of amendments proposed by Democrats. Delegate Larry Rowe, a Democrat from Kanawha County, asked that the governor's request for a $50 million agriculture lab at West Virginia State University be funded from budget back end surplus money. This is needed. This will benefit us. Uh, I just can't tell you how much and how it will lift West Virginia State into a new level of research and, and delivery of agricultural services throughout southern West Virginia. Delegate Kayla Young, a Democrat from Kanawha County, proposed an amendment to allot $44 million from surplus budget funds for child care programs, championed early on by Republican leadership and promised by Governor Jim Justice. Last week, the federal government mandated that we do enrollment versus attendance to pay for child care and there is funding proposed with the federal government, but we all know they're not so fast at doing anything. And our child care centers are in desperate need of this money to keep maintaining having all of their services and keep all the slots open. Again, concerned over balancing monies being poured into education, House Finance Committee co-chair Delegate John Hardy, a Republican from Berkeley County, urged and got a voice vote rejection for every Democrat proposed amendment. And I think that we're very, very early in this process of the federal government coming out in front of this and not being a priority of this legislature right now to be putting uh, monies being spent in the back of the budget as surplus revenue. With program funding concerns mounting and talk of a May special legislative session to finalize the budget, Delegate Daniel Linville, a Republican from Cabell County, questioned a possibly wasted effort. So. All these amendments are fashioned at House Bill 4025, is that right? Correct. And yet the vehicle that's going to be the budget is Senate Bill 200, is that right? That is correct. So everything that we're doing here does not matter in the least, does it? After rejecting the series of amendments, the House postponed any more debate on House Bill 4025 for one day. After a fire drill, the House returned to session and took up the Senate's budget bill that Linville referred to. Chris walked through every major department in the budget and indicated where the Senate budget was different from the governor's proposed budget. 
After a 45-minute discussion on Senate Bill 200, it passed by a 74 to 16 vote. The two chambers will now have to come together in a budget conference committee to work out differences between the two bills. For the legislature today, I'm Randy Yoey at the Capitol. Two bills debated in the House Judiciary Committee this morning dealt with two lightning rod issues, crimes regarding married couples and sexual abuse, and setting parameters on teaching scientific theories when it comes to the creation of the universe and of life. Randy Yoey has more. Senate Bill 280 allows teachers in public schools to discuss scientific theories. Debate on the proposal focused on science versus theology and a possible stifling of student idea and thought. The bill says no public school board, school superintendent, or school principal shall prohibit teachers from discussing or answering questions from students about scientific theories of how the universe and or life came to exist. It was asked in committee if a student asked, how did life begin? Committee counsel said answering with intelligent design or creationism would be legally risky. Delegate Andy Shamblin, a Republican from Kanawha County, disagreed. I don't teach science, but I, I teach civics, I teach AP U.S. government, and this debate over creationism is definitely a, a public policy debate that has went on forever in America. And this doesn't require a teacher to teach creationism. This, all this bill does is say that if the subject is brought up, the teacher can discuss that subject. But Delegate Evan Hansen, the Democrat from Monongalia County, said creationism or intelligent design is not among scientific theories like the Big Bang and evolution. They're not saying you shall believe in the Big Bang. They're saying the Big Bang is the dominant theory right now and there may be other scientific theories. What I object to is not that. What I object to is inserting theology into science class. And I object to the idea that just by calling something a scientific theory makes it science. Senate Bill 280 was sent to the House floor with recommendation that it pass. The committee also passed Senate Bill 190, modifying the definition of sexual contact. Focused on married couples, the bill removes marriage as an exception regarding the crime of sexual abuse. Charges of sexual assault between a married couple is already in state criminal code as rape. For the legislature today, I'm Randy Yoey at the Capitol. With four days left in this legislative session, tension between the two chambers is rising. Each chamber is waiting for their prospective bills to be passed by the other chamber before the fast approaching deadline. The Senate passed 25 bills today, about half of which were House bills and the others Senate appropriations bills. The Senate cruised through the other chamber's bills, like House Bill 4998, that would increase the penalties for the third offense of shoplifting, or House Bill 4768, that expands a program for out-of-state medical students who receive in-state tuition if they agree to stay in the state and work for the same amount of years they received the in-state tuition. However, the process hit a snag when an otherwise non-controversial bill was set to be voted on. House Bill 5002 would require at least one baby changing station to be placed in all men's bathrooms at rest areas in the state. And I rise in opposition to House Bill 5002. That's Senator Mike Wolfel, a Democrat from Cabell County. He says this is essentially in retaliation for the House's failure to advance bills sent over to them from the Senate. None of those bills or very few of those bills based on my review of today's agendas in the House have been looked at even examined, much less not, never, never showing up on an agenda. What they send us, a bill about changing a poopy diaper at a rest area, is a metaphor, I'm sorry, Mr. President, but it's a pretty good metaphor for how they do business down the hall, and I urge a no vote. After a brief discussion between Senate President Craig Blair, a Republican from Berkeley County, and Majority Leader Tom Zacubo, a Republican from Kanawha County, the bill was parked in Senate rules. A small but powerful committee responsible for setting the agenda for what bills hit the floor and have a chance to advance. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I question unanimous consent that House Bill 5002 be referred to the Committee on Rules. Is there objection? Chair hears none. So ordered. School discipline was identified as a key issue coming into this year's legislative session. But with the session's end just days away, a key school discipline bill is in question after a contentious committee meeting Monday afternoon. Chris Schultz has more. Senate Bill 614 aims to expand teachers' ability to remove disruptive students to the elementary level from grades kindergarten through six. But the bill also has further requirements, including suspension of the unruly student and placement in alternative education. Lindsay McIntosh, general counsel for Kanawha County Schools, brought up several concerns when the Senate Education Committee discussed the bill in February. She was on hand again Monday afternoon in the House Education Committee, this time to warn legislators that, as written, the bill could spell federal legal trouble for schools. McIntosh says the bill's requirement to have disruptive students assessed triggers special education protections under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, also known as IDEA. Those federal protections are incongruous with the bill's requirement to remove students from their classroom. It's going to create an ambiguity that is going to lead to litigation. There is no way above that or beyond that. Um, if, if we have teachers that are asking for these students to be removed and the law says technically they are a protected student under the IDEA, which all of these kids would be because they're all about triggering child fine under this language, yeah. then we as a school system have to figure out how to litigate and are we under the IDEA or are we, are we complying with the law? SB 614's lead sponsor and Senate Education Chair, Senator Amy Grady, a Republican from Mason County, was on hand to defend the bill. She says the bill's requirements raise the standard for all counties. The whole purpose is to remove that child immediately, yep. one to three days. And there have been school systems who say we can't do a risk assessment or we can't do um, analysis in three days. Well, you can. You're just not doing it right now because there's nobody forcing your hand to get it done right away. And this is kind of what we want to do is make sure we get that done quickly rather than them dragging their feet for two weeks at a time and saying we don't have that ready. Grady, a teacher, has consistently said that discipline is the number one issue for teachers driving them away from the profession, and robbing other students of their right to learn. She said SB 614 isn't perfect, but something needs to be done to help the situation, and it can be reassessed moving forward. You need more people to help with risk, risk assessments, then so be it. That's what you do. You rearrange things. That's what we do in education. We, we make do with what we have, and so I think that, that that's the best way we would do it now. And if it seems like there are a lot of referrals in specific counties or specific areas, then we have to revisit that and see what needs to be done. We don't have an answer for everything. I wish we did. And I wish that this bill solved every problem we have. It would be so great. I, I worked so hard to try to make this perfect, and I realized that it's not perfect. It's never going to be perfect because, let's face it, every kid is different. Every county is different. Every school is different. Every teacher is different. And so... It's not a one-size-fits-all. After more than an hour of discussion over the bill's language and potential changes to ensure compliance with federal requirements, the committee adjourned without taking further action on SB 614. With only four days left in the regular session, the bill's future is unclear. Language similar to, but less stringent than SB 614, is included in House Bill 5262, also known as the Teacher's Bill of Rights, which has cleared both education committees and is now pending in Senate finance. For the legislature today, I'm Chris Schultz in Morgantown. Community air monitoring took the front burner in the Senate Energy Industry and Mining Committee today. The panel took up House Bill 5018, which would restrict how data from citizen monitors could be used in the regulatory process or in court. A public hearing was held earlier on the bill, with most of the speakers opposed. Also, the West Virginia Office of Energy released a priority action plan last week. Curtis Tate will get us caught up on those two items. Our guests today are Morgan King with Climate Reality and Delegate Evan Hansen of Monongalia County. Uh, the first thing I want to say, though, is that we did attempt to invite uh, Republican lawmakers to discuss these issues with us. We did want to hear their perspective. They are, after all, in the majority, uh, but it's getting toward the end of the session and none were available. Just wanted to make that clear. 
Um, so, Morgan, um, there was supposed to be a, a hearing today on uh, House Bill 5018, uh, which affects uh, community air monitoring in, in the Senate Energy Committee. Uh, that did not happen, but uh, you were saying earlier that that should happen tomorrow. Can you tell me a little bit, a little bit about that bill briefly and uh, where you think it's going? Yeah, House Bill 5018 is really concerning because it would limit community air monitoring. Um, I've put up several air monitors myself here in the Kanawha Valley trying to like fill the gap that we see in air monitoring in the state. There's only one actually in the entire county of Kanawha County and it's just nearby here on the East End. Um, so we've increased that number by uh, up to almost a dozen now here in the county. And if this bill passes, we're gonna see uh, limitations on how that data can be used to protect our communities and uh, inform with more thorough data and science as to what, our air is, what air we're even breathing. Oh, well, Delegate Hansen, I, uh, I know you have some concerns with it as well, uh, and you opposed it. Uh, what, 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 would you, what more would you like to add? I did speak out against the bill when it was on the House side. This is data that's collected where people live and where people breathe. And it's important that that data can be used potentially in a court of law if there's a lawsuit that's proper or considered by regulatory agencies who are, whose job it is to make sure that the air is clean. Uh, now, it's my understanding that, that the U.S. EPA uh, is offering um, funding to states to expand and enhance community air monitoring. Is that something that would help in this situation? I think it helps people understand whether the air is safe in their communities. So I welcome that funding to come to West Virginia. So we have more data, not less. W would, it, would it actually expand the number of air monitors? I think there's only something like 12 or 13 statewide. Yes, and those are federally established monitors by the EPA. Um, the monitors that we're putting up are community air monitors um, that can be placed on people's homes, on people's businesses, um, and produce data onto a real-time map that you can look at right now on your cell phone. Um, and so that EPA money, should we get it and apply to it, um, would allow more community air monitors to be put up, ideally in the hundreds. We'd like to see air monitors in a grid across the entire state to actually get um, representative data of our air. Okay, well, uh, th there will be a hearing tomorrow in, in uh, Senate Energy and we'll be following that. Uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about is that the, uh, the State Office of Energy uh, released last week what it uh, calls its Priority Energy Action Plan. And I think, De Delegate Hansen, you have a copy of it there. It's about 64 pages, roughly speaking. Um, there, were, there were a few things that, that certainly stood out uh, about it to me, but, uh, but I'll, wh why don't you tell us what, uh, how you reacted to it? Well, first of all, I appreciate that we finally have a plan that's looking at greenhouse gas emissions from different parts of the West Virginia economy. It's important to know where we've been and where we are now so that we could try to find ways to reduce emissions in the future. But what I found lacking in the plan was their scenario for the future for how to reduce emissions from West Virginia. The Office of Energy talks about having an all of the above approach, but if you look at their future scenario, it's pretty much all about fossil fuels, even though there's many different types of energy available with no greenhouse gas emissions. So like when I searched the document for the word wind, the word wind does not show up in this energy plan. The word solar shows up once and the word battery does not show up at all. Despite the fact that wind and solar renewables plus battery storage, this is what's being used across the country to cost effectively reduce emissions and create jobs. But that's missing from this plan. Well, in, in the absence of, of uh, especially wind and solar and batteries was, was striking to me. Another thing, though, that, that was striking about it is just how much methane is produced by, by mining activity, by, by coal mining especially, but also oil and gas production. Uh, did, did, did you see a, a, a clear solution there? Well, I did see that, and methane's a really important greenhouse gas, and that needs to be part of the state strategy. So I'm glad that that's in there. Uh, there are some federal programs to help reduce methane emissions from oil and gas wells, um, a lot of funding coming to states to plug some wells. Uh, but there are steps that we should be taking at the legislature to make sure we don't have even more orphan and abandon oil and gas wells that are going to be leaking methane into the atmosphere. There's the 
there's bills that the legislature, this majority, has decided not to take up. We'll come back to that in a second, but what, Morgan, any thoughts about this uh, document? Yes, absolutely. Particularly on methane emissions, I think it's important to note that some of the solutions in this Priority Energy Action Plan um, are the um, building up of blue hydrogen or fossil fuel-based hydrogen that would increase fracking that could produce methane infiltration into the water, more methane pollution into our air, um, and also um, there is the risk of, as Delegate Hansen mentioned, the um, continuation of our fossil fuel economy. Um, fossil fuel-based hydrogen, as well as carbon capture and sequestration, have been disproven at this point as um, impactful and scalable and economic climate solutions. And so I think that's a, a huge concern of mine in this plan, um, where we don't see these true renewables even mentioned but one time in the entire 64-page document while they're prioritizing um, some of the same uh, sources of industry that we've been um, exploited by and polluted by for so long. Well, one thing that's been clear to me since, since I've been in West Virginia is the legislature is very protective of, of uh, the coal industry and, in fact, last year uh, moved to make it harder to close coal-fired power plants. What are the things in here uh, is it says, well, you know, you can, you can uh, decrease carbon emissions by improving the efficiency of uh, the coal plants. Those coal plants are fairly old. They're 40, 50 years old plus in some cases, and, and really, uh, it, it didn't seem like the, 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 that was the, necessarily the biggest bang for the carbon buck, if you will, uh, that, that it, 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 the, the efficiency measures would, would take some carbon out of the picture, but it was maybe the smallest uh, result from you know, any of the, the possible strategies. So ju just any, any thoughts about that? If you're gonna keep the coal-fired power plants running, you want them to be as efficient as possible. So that's not necessarily a bad thing, but there are alternatives like wind and solar and storage that we already have today that can be deployed cheaply and create thousands of jobs in West Virginia. And so we need to be looking forward to how we could thrive in a low carbon future rather than just trying to maintain the industries that we had in the past. No matter what we do, the coal industry is going to continue in West Virginia for some number of decades. There's still going to be coal jobs. There's still going to be coal-fired power plants that are open. But that shouldn't stop us from investing in truly diversifying the economy. Um, well, let, let's use the remaining time we have to talk about uh, what has and hasn't happened in this uh, session that's now kind of drawing toward a close. Um, you know, there, there were some... Uh, bills that, that you, you, Delegate Hansen, um, um, sponsored and, and wanted to, to, you know, wanted to see passed, obviously, maybe, you know, not just this year, but in years past, um, but they didn't really make any, get any traction. So could you, uh, could you tell us about that? There's a community solar bill I've introduced for a few years. There's a companion bill on the Senate side. And what we've heard from the solar industry is that if that bill passed, um, they'd invest tens to hundreds of millions of dollars in West Virginia, and it would generate thousands of jobs. So these are real jobs. We, states that have had this policy implemented have generated similar numbers of jobs and investments. How many states have community solar? About half, roughly half. Okay, and this is where you can subscribe. You don't necessarily have to have rooftop panels. Right, that allows you to subscribe to a somewhat larger project. Maybe it's on a brownfield site, maybe it's on the roof of an industrial site or something like that. And it, it's really good for people who rent their homes or maybe have a home that is shaded by trees. Mm -hmm. uh, Morgan, any particular bills that, that you wanted to see advanced that didn't? Yeah, the um, Abandoned and Orphaned Well Protection Act. Um, is an important bill and even this uh, priority energy action plan mentioned the importance of plugging abandoned oil and gas wells um, yet we didn't see this bill advance which would have brought a tremendous number of jobs and also prevented significant methane pollution and volatile organic compound pollution in our state uh, delegate hansen i think you mentioned that there was a another bill that you sponsored that didn't uh, make it very far i've sponsored a bill the last couple of years to require the utilities to invest in energy efficiency. And that's a jobs bill because making our homes and businesses more energy efficient require people in West Virginia. 
uh, making those improvements. So it's a way to reduce emissions for people to save money on their electric bill and to create local jobs. Uh, Morgan, about 30 seconds left. What do you think? Yeah, I just think it's so important that we're investing in a, a greener future for our communities. We see that this Priority Energy Action Plan couldn't even say the word climate change in its title, just like our neighboring state Virginia did when they released their plan recently. So it's important we invest in our future through true green and climate solutions. Well, that, that's about all the time we have. Uh, there's certainly no, no shortage of, uh, of things to talk about. Thank you for spending this time with us. Catch the legislature today, Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. And remember, WV Public Broadcasting covers the session daily in our radio program, West Virginia Morning, and on our news site at wvpublic.org. I'm Brianna Heaney. For everyone here at WVPB, thank you for joining us and have a great evening. Support for the legislature today is provided by West Virginia University, offering education, health care, and the opportunity to achieve career success since 1867. Information at go.wvu.edu slash forward.